Missionaries to China in the last part of the 19th century began to push into the interior of that great land. And as they did, they found a community where the main crop was potatoes. The community had a good climate, they had good soil, but their harvest was always tiny little potatoes about the size of marbles. The natives said that large potatoes just didn't grow there. The missionaries asked, well, have there ever been any large potatoes here? They said, oh, yes, years ago, we had really large potatoes. They asked, well, what did you do with them? They said, we ate them. Big potatoes are the best. The missionaries discovered that what they had done was to sabotage their crop by planting only the runts and keeping the best, largest potatoes for themselves. They had planted potatoes that were producing genes for much smaller potatoes. So they said to the natives, you have to plant the big ones, the best that you have, and if you'll do that, you'll grow even bigger ones. Now, we may smile at the ignorance of these primitive people, but before we criticize them, we need to recognize that this is exactly what we often do in our area of stewardship. We often say, I want to keep the best for myself. Whatever's left over, the small potatoes, I'll give that to God. If we have any leftover, after we've done what we want to do with our resources, we might give a little to God. We give God the leftovers, and then we wonder why we don't have the best that God has to offer. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. As we move into 1 Corinthians 16, Paul talks to us about this, the subject of stewardship. And, and this is really an interesting transition to say the least. I mean, think about it. Paul took us to the lofty heights of the resurrection in chapter 15, and then in chapter 16, he says, now concerning the collection. But if you think about it, it really makes perfect sense because every time we think about our future glory, it should cause us to be more faithful and responsible in the here and now. And when you really think about it, investing in eternity is the single issue of stewardship. Investing in eternity. The word of God makes it clear that what we do with our temporal resources that we have in this life makes a tremendous difference in eternity. If we truly believe that we are going to one day be resurrected from the dead, that we're going to perhaps be raptured from the earth when Christ returns, then we should be doing everything we possibly can do now to lay up treasures in heaven. Now we see a radical shift here from the doctrinal to the practical in chapter 16. This Last chapter of 1 Corinthians deals, deals with some very practical matters. And of course, the first one is the issue of stewardship. Paul is giving the Corinthians some instructions here that has helped to really guide stewardship of Christians down through Christian history, through church history. These principles provide guidance concerning such things as how the church should best receive its funds. That's addressed here. 
We have information about how individual believers should be disciplined in their giving. We're going to talk about that tonight. We see how God uses the resources that we give to accomplish his purposes. So we're going to walk through this passage of Scripture. And by the way, some pastors are really hesitant to talk about giving. I don't mind teaching on it at all because it is a vital aspect of our Christian discipleship. It is a a very important part of what it means to follow Christ. So I don't hesitate to talk about it at all. Jesus knew how important this topic was. That's why 16 of the 35 parables of Jesus had something to do with some aspect of money, possessions, or some other area of stewardship. This is a very, very important subject. And Jesus knew that most people in this world spend a great amount of time and energy with something that has to do with money, either making money or managing money or spending money or doing something with money. And we also know that money is a great temptation to many, many people, and greed is a problem. And so we need to know what the Bible has to say in this area of money management. The Bible even tells us this. It tells us the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith, and others have pierce themselves with many griefs. Money can be very problematic. That's why the Bible says so much about it. That's why preachers should not hesitate to preach about it. Now, certainly, we could go to the other extreme. I've seen this on a few occasions, and we could harp on giving all the time. I don't think that's probably good uh, to do. Some churches seem to do that. We must keep it in balance, but we must preach on it as often as the Bible itself deals with it. Now, these principles here are not given in the form of commands, although Paul does give a command in verse 1. But really, this is given more as a pattern of giving that pleases God. And Paul really sets an example here for all the saints to follow. I believe these principles are still very valid for our day and time. Paul begins with the reason for the offering. The reason for the offering, that's verse 1. Look at verse 1 with me. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you Also, we see the primary purpose for our giving is found in that little phrase, for the saints, in verse 1. The first principle that we encounter is that New Testament giving is primarily for the benefit of the saints, the church of Jesus Christ. It's the highest priority for our giving. This collection happened to be for specific saints, but we can extrapolate the general principle from this, that the first priority for our giving is to be for the church. It is to benefit the saints. Who were these saints that this collection was being taken for? Well, we see in verse 3 that this was a special offering being gathered for the saints in Jerusalem. In fact, Paul referred to the collection here, and that means they already had prior knowledge of this. He calls it the collection. The truth of the matter is Paul had been soliciting funds from the churches of Galatia as well as the churches of Macedonia and Achaia for well over a year, they already knew about this offering. 
What was this offering for? Well, Acts chapter 11 tells us that there had been a severe famine that had come to Jerusalem, and the church there had a lot of poverty among its members as a result of that famine. And so Acts 11.27 says, now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them was named Agabus. He stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world, and this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the in in proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. They're collecting this for the uh, poverty-stricken saints there in Jerusalem. They're sending it through Paul and Barnabas to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. In addition to this, Many of the Christians in the church at Jerusalem had been severely persecuted for their faith. When they became believers, many of them lost their possessions and they lost their jobs as a result of converting to Christianity. They were outcasts, and this created even more poverty. These Christians were having a really tough time. And so Paul was getting an offering from all the churches uh, that he had established and, and he is sending the offering now to the mother church. But you know what? Paul had another purpose in mind. Not only to help relieve the poverty of these believers there, but he had another important reason in mind as he took this offering. You see, the church in Jerusalem was made up of primarily Jews, while the other churches were primarily Gentiles. And it had been very difficult for the Jews in Jerusalem to fully accept the Gentile Christians on the same plane as the Jewish believers. And Paul knew that this kind of loving gesture, this offering would really help the Christians there to see the church as one. And so Paul had this motive in mind as well. In writing about this very same collection to the Romans, Paul said this, he said, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Because the Bible tells us that salvation originally came through the Jewish people, the Gentiles were indebted to the Jews for their salvation. And so this offering then became an expression of their gratitude. But let's get back to the general principle here. Even though this particular offering was for a specific need in a specific place at a specific time, that does not negate the pattern that this sets for the church throughout church history. We have a pattern here that I believe we are to replicate. There is a specific need for the church to meet, but guess what? There is always needs that the church can meet that will accomplish God's will. And, and so even though there's not this one specific need that Paul was raising this offering for, there are always needs in the church that can accomplish God's will. So the general principle here for the church 
is that believers' first priority in giving is to be to the church, is to be the church. As John MacArthur points out, a Christian's first obligation is to support fellow believers individually and collectively, while the church's first financial responsibility is to invest in its own life and its own people. The first priority. If you do a study of Scripture, I believe you will find that we have a responsibility to support the local New Testament church. You'll you'll see that priority. We have a responsibility to meet the needs of the needy in the church, benevolence needs. We have a responsibility to support the leadership of the church. The Bible's clear on that. We have a responsibility to to support the work of the church, especially evangelism and mission work around the world. Now, obviously, we have a responsibility to reach the lost and to share the gospel here in our local setting, but we also can be a part of sending missionaries around the world. And the point is, All of this is to be channeled through the local church. Now, we're going to see that more fully as we go through this, but I'll just introduce it right here. Secondly, we need to notice the response to the offering. Verse 2 gives us the details of what this offering was supposed to look like. Paul says, on the first day of every week, (coughs) each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Now, I want to break this verse. This is the key verse. I want to break this verse down into six parts to get the full ramification of the instruction that Paul is giving us here. There are six things that we need to see about God's plan for New Testament giving. The first one is the arrangement, the arrangement. Notice the first part of verse two. On the first day of the week, on the first day of the week, that is to be the arrangement or the pattern or the system of our giving. In other words... The church's giving is to be done in a very regular, weekly, disciplined way. That's how our giving should be as well. We know that's what Paul instructed the Corinthians to do. It's not to be sporadic. Our our giving is not to be based on some kind of emotional appeal. It's not to be directed by some kind of mystical prompting of the Spirit. It's not to be based on how much money we have left over after we spend it on what we want to spend it on. No, it's to be regular, weekly giving. It's to be persistent, disciplined, steady, week-by-week giving. What does this verse say? It says, on the first day of how many weeks? Every week. First day of every week. Not some weeks when you feel like it. No, every single week, even when you're on vacation. And it gets even more specific than that. It tells us exactly which day of every week we are to give, doesn't it? Which day? First day. First day of every week. What day is that? Of course, that's Sunday. That's the Lord's Day. Now, we know from Scripture that the Christians began worshiping on Sunday, the first day of the week, rather than on the Sabbath on Saturday as the Jews did. The Jews worshiped on the Sabbath in celebration of 
God's work of creation, but the early Christians began worshiping on Sunday in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The day of worship was changed. Every Sunday, as we gather together as Christians, we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. But Paul is making it clear here that systematic giving is to be a vital part of that worship. That's part of honoring our risen Lord. If we're truly worshiping, we also must be willing to give. Worship is an expression of love to God, and love always expresses itself in giving. You know, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. If you love your wife and family, you're going to give to them, right? I mean, it's just a natural expression of love. And so Paul says here, our giving should be a regular part of our weekly worship and expression of our love to God. This is an act of worship. This is an expression of our love. And just as the needs of the church are weekly, so our giving is to be weekly to support the work of the church. Now, I'm not going to get into a debate with anyone tonight over whether or not it is okay to give monthly if you are paid monthly, right? I'm not going to get it. That's not really Paul's point here. I don't think we need to get legalistic about that. But we do need to understand Paul's point is that our giving should be a regular part of our weekly worship. That's a vital part of our worship. It is just as important as singing. It's just as important as the preaching of the word. It is a vital aspect of our weekly worship. Well, I can already tell we're not going to get through all this tonight. Notice, secondly, the all-inclusiveness, the all-inclusiveness. How many, how many are to give weekly? How many? Each one of you, each one of you. How many are included here? All. How many are excluded? None. How many are given a legitimate excuse for not giving? How many? None. Now, I didn't write this. The Holy Spirit did, okay? Oh, but you see, Pastor, I give of my time. That's wonderful, and you should, but that doesn't exempt you from giving financially. Oh, but... I give of my talents. That's great. That's something you should do as well, but that doesn't exempt you from giving financially. This is talking about money here. It's talking about a financial offering. And the whole point here is that there are no exceptions and everyone is Included. The phrase each one means every believer by himself giving of his own initiative. Every one of us giving. There should not be a situation where a Christian is not giving financially to support the work of the Lord through his local church. That should never happen. If you are a part, of this body of believers and you are not giving financially to support the work of the Lord through this local church, you are in sin, plain and simple. That's what this passage says. And listen, you can't depend on someone else to give for you. You should not Depend on your parents, young people, to give in your place. You should give from what you earn. In fact, we should learn stewardship from the earliest of days. 
We ought to be teaching our children to give to the work of the Lord from the very first time they have something to give. In fact, give them something to take to church to give in the offering. Just get them into that pattern. We should help them learn stewardship as a lifelong pattern. By the way, occasionally I will hear someone who will say something like this, well, you know, pastor, I'd like to give to the Lord, but I don't make very much, and after all, I've got to pay my bills, or something to that effect. Listen, do you know who gives the most? Do you know who gives the most? According to a Time Magazine survey, those who have less give more. Those who have less give more. Poorer Americans give a greater percentage of their income to charity. In the survey, those who earned under $10,000 gave 5.2% of their income. Those who earned between 10,000 and 20,000 gave 3.3%, while those who earned between 75,000 and 100,000 gave 1.6%. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, what about the 10%? Well, we're not gonna go there yet. But everybody always thinks, well, if I made more, I'd give more. No, you wouldn't. That's a myth. It's a myth. If you're not giving on what you make now, you wouldn't give more if you made more. In fact, the more you make, the harder it is to give the same percentage because that amounts to more money, right? You know, Jesus said something very important in Luke 16, 10. He said, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. In other words, if you can't be faithful when you're poor, being rich isn't going to change your spiritual commitment. In fact, being rich will likely just compound the problem. Now, we're going to talk about how much to give later on. We're going to talk about that. And if you're not mad at me yet, just wait till we get to that part. But folks, listen, here's Paul's point. All of us who are born-again children of God are stewards, and he has blessed us with material resources. Is that not true? We are either faithful stewards or unfaithful stewards. We're either good stewards or bad stewards. And the area of giving financially to support the work of the Lord through the local church is a vital part of our stewardship. Now, that's not the only part of our stewardship, but it is a very important part. And that stewardship really is all-inclusive. It involves every one of us. doesn't matter whether we're young or old, rich or poor, male or female. All of us are to be a part of supporting the Lord's work. And it doesn't really matter whether the economy is good or bad. You know, I hear that all the time. Well, pastor, you know what? The economy is not very good right now. By the way, we can't say that right now. But if it is that way, oh, you know, pastor, the economy. No, it doesn't really matter if the economy is good or bad. It's not what we base it on. Because you see, the churches of Macedonia were in a really bad financial condition. But here's what Paul wrote to them in 2 Corinthians 8, 2. He said, in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Do you see the situation here? They were very, very poor. 
In fact, the phrase abundance of poverty means abject poverty. They were in abject poverty. They were worse than down and outs, but they gave generously to the offering that Paul was taking for the church in Jerusalem. And by the way, do you want to know why they were so willing to give so sacrificially when they were so poor? It tells us in verse 5, they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. That's the key. They had first given themselves to the Lord. Listen, if you have surrendered your heart and your all to the Lord, then giving to support his work through his church is really nothing. That's just kind of a sidelight. They gave out of their love and devotion to the Lord. That's where generous giving starts. My friend, show me someone who is giving very little to the Lord's work, and I'll show you someone who has very little love and devotion for the Lord because it's a reflection of that. I believe that if someone really loves the Lord, they will not be able to keep from giving. I mean, they're going to want to give. They're going to be asking, how, how can I give my offering? The quality and quantity of one's giving is based upon the quality of one's worship and devotion. And the amount of one's offering really is not the issue here. It's the sacrifice. These Macedonian believers sacrificed. They didn't have much, but they gave sacrificially. Someone who is very well off financially can often give quite a bit without really missing it. But those who are in poverty, when they give, it is sincere, it is sacrificial. But the gift that shows true generosity is the one that involves some kind of sacrifice. And that really, that's the kind of gift that expresses true love and devotion to God. Now, we aren't to the amount yet, but I think David had a pretty good handle on this when he said in 2 Samuel 24, 24, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. I'm not even going to worship that way unless it costs me something. It's not really sincere worship. We're all stewards. We're all to be a part of supporting the work of the Lord, and we're all to do it with a willing, grateful heart in devotion to God. So we have the arrangement is to be on the first day of the week. We have the all-inclusiveness, let each one of you. Thirdly, we have the action, the action. The next phrase says in the New American Standard is to put aside and save. Now, I use the New American Standard when I preach primarily because it is one of the most accurate translations from the original Greek. But this is one of those places where I believe the New American Standard misses it because this phrase makes it sound like we are to keep our own private savings account, and we're to put something aside every week for that. In fact, some teach this is exactly what we're to do. We're to put some money in our bank account every week so that we'll have some money saved, uh, saved up for when someone's in need. Now, that may be a good thing to do. I don't believe that's what this passage is teaching here. And although I do believe it's a wise thing to save... And that's another topic altogether. I also believe we always should be ready to help people who are in need. This passage is not talking about any of that. This passage is talking about putting money aside to bring with you when you go to worship with the other believers. That's why 
I mean, because if you think about it, if Paul was talking about saving up in a private savings account in your own home, then the phrase at the end of verse 2, which says that there be no gatherings or collections when I come, would make no sense. If everyone was saving up in his own bank account at home, then the first thing that would have to happen when Paul arrived, would he would have to have it all gathered up, right? Besides that, why would Paul say that this is to be done on the first day of the week? Because if that's what you were doing, you really could do that any day of the week, right? No, this passage is talking about bringing your offering every Sunday to the place into which the common collection of the church is made. And I believe the Greek words that are used here carry the idea of uh, taking some money from the rest of your income and giving it in the offering. The RSV has put something aside. The NIV has set aside a sum of money But the idea is to take it out of your paycheck so you'll have it to give on Sunday when you go to worship. In other words, this is the idea of planned giving. Planned giving. You plan ahead of time what you're going to give so you'll have it and you set it aside so you don't spend it on something else and you have it to give on Sunday. You see, our giving is to be premeditated. It's not to be a a last-second thought. We ought to give to God first. We, We give to God the first fruits. We give him the best. I mean, the first thing we ought to do when we get paid is to write our tithe check. Let's not wait until we've paid all our bills and spent all we want to spend on whatever we want and then see if there's anything left over for God. That's not God's plan. This is not talking about putting something into your private bank account, but having it set aside and ready to take to church with you as your offering. The giving of our tithes and offerings should not be just an afterthought on Sunday morning. I mean, you should not come to church and get to the time of the offering and then suddenly go, oh, where's my checkbook? Well, some of you don't even know what a checkbook is. But if you have one, then you might think, oh, I left it at home. Well, I'll just throw a couple bucks in that I have in my pocket. No, it's planned giving. We're to plan ahead and have it ready, have it set aside for when we come to worship. Well, fourthly, we see the arena, the arena. Notice in verse 2 that Paul uses the phrase, uh, and here in the King James it says, in store, lay aside in store. This is an interesting Greek word. It is the word thesarizo, from where we get our English word thesaurus, which is a collection of words. That's what a thesaurus is. This word, this Greek word, is used to refer to a storehouse or a treasury, a depository for safekeeping. And in both pagan settings and in Jewish cultures of the New Testament era, Treasuries were almost always found in the religious temples. That's where the banks were. That's where the treasuries were. They were in the temples. And we might debate the the validity of using Malachi 3.10 as far as applying this to Christians, that the Christians are to give a tithe, and we'll talk about that later, but one thing we see in Malachi 3.10 is that Israel brought their tithes and offerings into what they called the storehouse. They brought it into the storehouse. The storehouse was the repository for the offerings of the people located in the temple. 
And I believe that Paul's use of this word here in chapter 16, verse 2, was a reference to the repository designated for the offering that was kept at the place where the believers gathered to worship. They had a place where everyone put their offering. I don't know what it looked like. I don't know if they had something on the wall like we have back in the foyer. I, I don't know if they had a box with a hole in it. But they had some place for everybody to put their offering. And from the very earliest days in the history of the church, we see that it was the common practice of the early Christians to come and to bring their offerings and to give their offerings to the leaders of the church who were then responsible for how those funds were used. And of course, we see in the book of Acts that at the first, they would bring their offerings and they would give them to the apostles. But when the apostles got to the place where they couldn't do everything, they appointed seven spiritually mature men to oversee the distribution of the funds. And these, of course, were the deacons. And this was a pattern that was established very early on in the young New Testament church. This is a pattern that has continued to our day and time. Now, let me just say something quickly because we're almost out of time tonight and we're going to bring this to uh, our wrap up here in just a moment. But let me just say something quickly about e-giving because now in our day and time, most everything is done electronically. It's done digitally. And you might not have something in your hand to put in the plate on Sunday morning. That is okay, but we need to make sure we're faithful stewards. And um, I saw one church that had, as part of their e-giving service, and oh, this might not be a bad idea, they had... If you gave online, they would send you a receipt and you could bring the receipt to put in the offering plate. That's just to have something tangible to put in the offering plate. I think that might be legalistic, but the point is that when we come, that our giving is just as much a part of our, our worship as anything else we do. Well, we're out of time for tonight and we still haven't gotten to the question of how much. I'll deal with that next time. I'm sure the place will be packed. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us enough that you even gave us instruction in concerning our giving. And Lord, we thank you because we know that's that's loving of you to, uh, to give us these instructions because you know how important material things are, are to us. You know how important uh, money is. You know how problematic money can be, how it can trip us up and cause us to fall into sin. And yet, Lord, we want to we wanna show our love to you. We want to demonstrate our faithfulness to you by being good stewards. So Lord, help us to do that. And Lord, I pray tonight that all of us would examine our own hearts and look at our own giving patterns and, and to see, are we doing what your word says? Are we doing it in a systematic way? Are we doing, uh, in a, doing this in a planned way? Are we planning ahead of time? And are we giving faithfully? So help us tonight as we deal with these principles. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.